If we start talking about uh, existence, uh, a uniqueness result for LCPs, uh, so just let's just remember how we're, you know, what our 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 game plan here is from the LCP standpoint. What we've been doing uh, is is we we take the Nash game and we show that the equilibrium conditions are. Are, are, are equivalent to an LCP and then we show this LCP is can be related to some QP and then we analyze this QP from the standpoint of existence. Okay, That's been our, our game plan. Now it's worth noting, it's worth noting that um, if you want to show feasibility, so for uniqueness it, we, we, we went through the same process. Now for for uh, existence, we will follow a similar trajectory. Uh, and remember, it's not like you can just look at the QP and say, well, the QP's optimality conditions are the same as, it's not as straightforward as that. You need some properties. Okay, you can't take an arbitrary LCP and just re you know, consider the, the related QP. You need some properties for this to happen. Um, now, what happens if those do properties don't, ha don't hold? We can talk about that you know, later. Um, so now let's talk about another result on existence. So the first uh, result here is if the LCP QM is feasible, then Q, the QP has an optimal solution and there exists a U star that satisfies this and, and this holds an addition. Okay? So the first thing is, if, since the LCP is feasible, so what does it mean for an LCP to be feasible? Remember I, I, I mentioned this uh, earlier. An LCP being feasible is just that I have an X that satisfies that. Okay, so LCP feasible implies there exists an X such that it's non-negative and MX plus Q is non-negative. Okay. Um, second, the quadratic function X transpose MX plus Q greater than or equal to zero is bounded over this feasible region. Okay. Now, the, the natural question is that uh, if, so why is it bounded? So the reason why it's bounded, so when I say something is bounded over, it means that it can't go to negative infinity. Right? So one of our big challenges when you have optimization problems is that suppose the function goes down to negative infinity and the problem isn't well posed. If I take the x in a certain direction, I get arbitrarily large or arbitrarily low costs. Why doesn't that happen here? It doesn't happen here because the objective is x transpose mx plus q, right? Since we know that x is non-negative and mx plus q is non-negative, we know x transpose mx plus q also has to be non-negative. So it's bounded below by zero, okay? Now, the question is that if a quadratic function f, and remember, I haven't said anything about positive semi-definiteness here. I've not said anything about a, the property of the matrix. Okay? So all I'm saying, all I've used here is the feasibility of the LCP. So if the quadratic function f is bounded below on a non-empty polyhedral set, what is a polyhedral set? A polyhedral set is a set which is formed by the intersection of a bunch of half spaces and linear e equalities. Okay? Um, so this quadratic function is bounded below on this non-empty polyhedron. And if that happens, then f attains its infimum or its minimum on x. Okay? It attains its minimum. And this comes from a, a celebrated result called the Frank-Wolf theorem. Okay? So why is that important? That's important because we know an optimal solution exists to this QP. Okay? Now, I haven't told you that it satisfies complementarity. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there exists a solution to this QP. Because if I give you an arbitrary QP, there's no real reason why this QP should have a solution. It could be feasible, but it could be going down to negative infinity. So now we know that there is a solution. Okay, so if there is a solution, by the necessary conditions of optimality, there exists a vector of multipliers such that the KKT conditions hold, right? The first order conditions hold. So these conditions, as we've discussed before, so, let me just write these conditions down for this problem. Yeah. 
So, I was looking at this problem minimize x transpose subject to bless you. Okay. And now what I am going to do is I am going to write down the uh, uh, KKT conditions for this. So, this okay. So, that is the multiplier. So, this is going to be m plus m transpose uh, x plus q minus m transpose u is equal to 0. Okay. And what you have is u is orthogonal to mx plus q. Uh, sorry, this is Um, okay, so I want to make sure that everybody understands how I've gotten this. Usually, what happens is I put a multiplier here, and what happens is when you take the, you get minus v equals zero, and then you write it as v is orthogonal to x, right? But v is exactly this, so we can skip a step and directly write zero is less than m plus m transpose x plus q minus m transpose u is orthogonal to x non-negative. Okay. Um, so, that is this orthogonality relationship is this one, u non-negative is this one and this relationship, these are the first three and then you have u transpose m x plus q and remember you have this from feasibility and you have that non-negative the multipliers that specified. Okay, bless you. So um, finally, I need to show that. So, so from the second condition and and now I want to show this result. Okay, so I haven't shown this result. So I want to make sure everybody understands what the results that I have shown. So I'm. The second result follows directly from the KKT conditions. Okay, I want to show this result. Okay, so let's show this result. X star minus U star, the ith component times M transpose X star minus U star, the whole thing, the ith component is is non-positive. Okay, so we know that. What do we know about X star? X star is non-negative, right? And so let's see. So, if you look at the, the second, what we have is this. That is the first condition. Sorry. And the second condition is this. Okay. So, one thing you want to remember is that generally you only add inequalities. You can only subtract when you have an inequality and an equality. Okay? So, you do not want to get into the habit of subtracting inequalities because unless you have got, you know, so, so you, that, that is not valid. You can, you can add an inequality, you can add two inequalities, you do not want to subtract inequalities. Right, because then it becomes you have to be very very careful with signs. So, uh, so here you are subtracting because you have an equality below. Okay, so now if I subtract this, what I get is x star transpose m x star minus m transpose u star, and um, which one have I got? Hang on a second. Okay. Uh, m transpose, yeah, there is an m transpose, uh, try to see why I, sh I should have a, oh, okay, I took, okay, so what I did was, I took the negative of this and I added it to this, and so then I get m transpose, 
m transpose x star minus u star less than 0. Okay. And which, um, and you can get this component wise. Okay. You can get component wise uh, x star i times m transpose x star minus u star, the ith component is less than 0. Okay. Um, now, if I multiply the first condition by u star, so if I multiply the first condition by u star, what you have is, so let me write that down. So if I multiply u star transpose mx star plus q equals 0, um, by multiplying the first condition by u star, oh, sorry. you're left with u star transpose um, q plus m plus m why is this true because u star is also non negative u star is a non so you're taking the inner product between two non negative vectors and that's going to be greater than or equal to 0 and now you subtract that this this inequality from this and what you're left with is, so I'm subtracting this from this, and you're left with u star, uh, u star transpose, what you have there, which is m transpose x star minus u star i, uh, sorry, gradient x. Okay. Now you've got this and this. Now you can switch the sign of this, you get negative is greater than or equal to 0 and then you can add it. Okay? And if you do that, you get u star minus x star, transpose this is greater than or equal to 0, you switch signs, you get this is less than or equal to 0. Okay? Now, so three questions. The first one was, if the LCPM is feasible and the QP is an optimal solution, how did we conclude that? We used Frank Wolf's theorem. He said, the remember Frank Wool's theorem? The, con the quadratic function is bounded below on a non-empty polyhedron X. How do I know it's non-empty? Well, because I said the LCPQM is feasible, which means there exists an X such that MX plus Q is non-negative and X is non-negative. Right? And the function is bounded below, which means it attains an optimal solution, which means the QP has an optimal solution. So that was part one. Sorry. The second was just directly KKT conditions. The third I proved, and I'm going to use this result. Okay. okay, so now this is the main theorem. When you have positive semi definite matrices, the existence theorems for LCPs are very simple. So you, all you need to do is check is the matrix positive semi definite, and then if you can show that it's feasible, you can show that it's, there is an optimal solution. And feasibility of so now, uh, so once I prove it, I'll comment on how to get a feasible solution to a set of inequality constraints. Okay, that's not, that's actually something that is tractable. Okay. Okay, so now, um, now by feasibility of the LCP, and I'm going to go through this proof a little slowly. So the feasibility of the LCP from the previous lemma, there exists vectors that satisfy this, right? We just proved this. If you, if you, since this holds for all i, if I take the inner product, the inner product is less than or equal to 0. Because we know that, so what this is saying is the ith component is non-negative. If I sum this up over all i, I get essentially this inner product and that's less than or equal to 0. Now, since m is positive semi-definite, then we have that this is greater than or equal to 0. So it, if something is less than or equal to 0 and greater than or equal to 0 implies that it has to be identically 0. 
Okay. So now what you have, if it's identically zero, you have that the left hand side is equal to the right hand side, which is equal to zero. Okay. And if that is true, then you can denote, you can uh, construct an x star by noting the following. Okay. So x star in solution QM can be deduced from the following. So x star. So remember what we had. We had essentially x star transpose Q plus mm transpose x star minus m transpose u star. Where did I get this from? I got this from the KKT conditions of the QP. What do I do next? I just split it up and I get this. And now what I've done is I know from here that this is zero. See, the same term, this is zero. So this thing is zero and I just get this. The left side is zero because of the complementarity, right? So because x star is, is in sol QM. Um, and so as a consequence, you can show that you have complementarity holding. Okay, so what did we do? We basically, we had a step before this, we, were a, we needed this requirement. Then from positive semi-definiteness, we were able to conclude that this held. With this, we were able to show that each of the summons of this is zero. Once we did that, we were just trying to see if we could show this was zero. We saw that this could have been expressed from the complementarity conditions, from the KKD conditions of the QP. Remember, the KKD conditions do not directly give you the requirement you want, right? Because the KKD conditions just tell you that you're at a KKT point of the quadratic program. That doesn't tell you that the complementary, that, that you're satisfying this requirement. But then when you analyze it, you find, oh, that extra term that I have, that disappears. So you immediately get the complementarity that you want. Remember, the KKT conditions just come from this. See this condition? This condition, from this condition, you can't claim that X star transpose Q plus M of X star is zero. That's what you would need to show that X star is a solution to the LCP. For you to get that, you need to make sure that this part disappears. And the way we showed this part disappears is using this expression and just going through it. Okay. So what did we do just to kind of remind you? We basically started by trying to say that uh, if the LCP is feasible, then it, is, it has an optimal solution under the caveat that M is positive semi-definite. More generally, this doesn't hold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Mm -hmm. uh, our M matrix is, was it the positive semi-definite? Yeah, it was I plus, remember it was I plus E transpose minus A transpose A. So it is a skew symmetric matrix, it is positive semi-definite. Uh, but there's one more thing there, right? You need to show that you have a feasible solution mm -hmm. to the inequality constraint. So in the Cournot case, if it's a constrained nash Cournot game, suppose I send the capacities as negative. There's no feasible solution, right? So the thing is, you need to have a feasible solution to each player's problem. And if that holds, then you get, and that's natural. That's a physically natural condition. Yes. It just may be my like, no, 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 no. algebra, but uh, uh, in that matrix, we had, uh, uh, it wasn't symmetric. Uh, so it was skew symmetric. And here also, you don't need symmetric. I don't need M to be symmetric here. Okay. okay. That's why I have a transpose there. If it's symmetric, then the transpose, I don't need the transpose. Okay, so this is one of our first few con existence conditions. Okay, so now we're going to move to somewhat more involved uh, existence statements. Now, these existence statements, the previous ones, were f a little simpler because they worked in a regime which was quadratic. What happens when the problem becomes a little more complex, where you don't have these nice conditions? Can you still recover existence theory? And so the fundamental uh, framework comes from topology and more generally nonlinear analysis. So the classical tool, right, for s studying the existence to equations of this form, whether, so it, one of the reasons why I wrote the problem in terms of this natural map, so remember what I told you earlier in this lecture, x is a solution of vi xf if x is a zero of this equation. So in effect, the question very simply boils down to, when does this system, when you know, equal to zero, have a solution? That's the question, right? And what degree theory buys you is the ability to understand that with a greater depth. Okay, it's basically an equation-solving problem, and this is very general now. This F is the general map; it subsumes linear complementarity problems. You know, it's equivalent to complementarity problems if you have a cone, 
Uh, if you don't get into the algebraic structure, it captures most convex static Nash games. Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to make sure everybody understands because some details in this are going to be a little, right? But I want to make sure that we all understand why we're doing what we're doing. There are certain details we can keep working on those. So now the question is going to be, when does this system, f not x equal to 0, have a solution? Because if it has a solution, if I can guarantee it has a solution, then the original problem is solvable, okay? which means that the original game has an equilibrium. Okay? So now let's go ahead and think about that. Yeah. Um, just to yeah, yeah. Which, which, are you talking about this problem? No, no, I haven't given you the, I, I'm going to start working on the theory. I haven't told you anything about when this, I'm going to, I'm just telling you that that's what we're going to start looking at now. Yeah, so what we did this morning, the x, the only requirement on x that I have is that it's closed and convex. And f? f is just a continuous mapping. So it's just a great, you know, it's basically a continuous mapping. It has, yeah, I have no other requirements on it. Okay. Um, Okay, so we use a, a theory called degree theory. Okay, so degree theory is actually a more general theory that is used for partial differential equations, a host of other problems. Okay, now the notion of a degree involves three objects. Okay, so this is a little abstract, and we'll work through it together. Okay, um, uh, and these three objects are basically a function, an interval, and a value. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to show you what each of those mean. Okay, so essentially. I have a picture actually. The picture will make things quite easy, clear. So essentially what I have is a function, right? That's the first object. The second is the interval. I'm interested in interval a, b, some interval. And the third is I want to know which value, what is the value that I'm looking to see where, what, you know, what, what I'm looking to see when the function takes on a certain value. And that value is given by this purple dotted line or that dotted line. Okay, so basically, if it takes on this value, it takes it on here, 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 and here. So in our world, that those would all be equilibria when f of x is equal to p. Okay, so if it's equal, it, this effectively says that there are four solutions for this value of p. For this value of p, there are only two solutions. If I put a p that is right on top there, above that line, there are no solutions, at least not within this interval. Okay? So the notion of degree requires these three objects. The function, p, which is the critical threshold, I mean not the threshold, the value that you're interested in, and the interval. Okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise this in terms of dimension. I was interested in using the natural map, and we're going to look at the same thing but in a larger space. But in the simpler space, you know, the, the understanding persists. Okay, so, so, yeah. So, does this give us a measure of how, um, how undulating a function is? Or what, what no, so, uh, what, so I'm going to proceed. All that it tells us is a solution exists. For, for this value? Right, so for instance, if I tell you, if I ask you the question, does the variational inequality have a solution in the set X? Right? And, and, the, and this will provide you with an answer to yes or no. It won't tell you how many equilibria there are. There's a continuum, continuum of equilibria. In fact, if it's like a test, and if the test comes out as negative, it doesn't mean there aren't equilibria. But if it comes out as positive, there are equilibria. And I'll show you how that works as well. So there's a, it's a differentiable function, but our functions are continuous, but this can be weakened. Don't worry. The interval is an open bounded interval. Right? I'm not considering endpoints. I'll show you what we do with the endpoints. And this is the value. So for instance, in our case, p is 0. Right? We, we're interested in the point, the x for which f nat of x is 0. Because when f nat of x is 0, it means x is a solution to vi xf. Right? Now the degree, how do we define the degree? The degree takes as its input three objects, the function, the interval, and p. And it measures the number of times the gradient changes in sign. For the, this is for the univariate case. Right? So now let's look at it. So this is the sign of the gradient. So remember, the gradient is positive, the sign is plus 1. If the gradient is negative, the sign is minus 1. 
Okay. So now let's look at this. Let's take this p. Here the gradient is what? Negative. Negative. So this is minus one, and you're looking at this interval. So here it's plus one. So minus one plus one is zero. Here it's again minus one. So it's so the total degree, if you're looking at this interval, is going to be what? Negative one. Right? Now suppose you stop the interval here, what would happen? It would be minus one plus one, the degree is zero. So usually what happens is if the degree is non-zero, you know there was a that the function intersected this line. The real thing you're trying to check for is how many times this function intersects this line. Now, if it intersects it twice, it has to go and come up. Once it does that, basically the sign changes and you don't have any information left. That's one of the things with this degree notion. If it does it an odd number of times, then you immediately know that there is at least one solution. But the selection of p is very important. Here, right? right. So in our case, it's not, it's just one p, right? It's just zero. So, so here, of course, we're looking at a root finding problem. We're interested in f of x equals p. But in our case, it's, there is no question of selection of f, uh, of x, uh, sorry, of p, because it's always zero, right? I'm interested in the point x where f nat of x is equal to zero, right? So I'm interested in f nat of x where this is equal to zero. So this is like f, this is the p, right? And I'm, I'm looking at the set capital X, okay? So is the so and we're going to go through it. So don't you know? Uh, yeah, just hold on for a sec. Now, if P does not lie in the closure of F A B, let me make sure everybody understands what this means. F A B is are these values. So the values that F takes between here to here. So look, this is here. And if P doesn't lie in that closure then we have that the degree is zero. So if P doesn't, you know, the, because look how, so the closure of F A B is basically this whole interval from here to here, right? Because look, when X varies, the F value goes, the lowest value it takes is this, and the highest value it takes is that, right? So suppose I set P here, it will never intersect, right? If I set P on top, as Jalal said, it will never intersect. And if it doesn't intersect, which means P does not lie in this closed uh, interval of the image of FAB, then the degree is zero. It doesn't intersect. So that's trivial, right? Okay. So when degree of FAB is equal to zero, we cannot in say in general whether the equation is a solution or not. This is very important, right? When you understand this, you have to know just because the degree is zero doesn't mean there's no solution. You just don't have enough information that degree is zero. If the degree is non-zero, you know there's a solution. Okay, so let's make sure that we all understand that. Okay, now how do you deal with continuous functions? And why am I interested in continuous functions? Because the natural map is a continuous function. It's got the projection operation sitting inside. It's not a differentiable function. So I need to be able to deal with continuous functions. Okay, so now let's take some simple cases that we can all understand. Okay. So here's one case where the function is a times x, okay, where a is a non-singular matrix, right? So I'm interested in this, I'm interested in a set omega, and I'm interested in this ax equals zero. So ax is the function, zero is p, and omega is just a set that I'm checking. So I'm checking for solutions to that system. Now if a is non-singular, we know that x equals 0 is a solution to this, right? So if I said omega is an open set containing the origin, contains 0, then we know that this has to be plus or minus 1. There's only one solution to this. Because, and why, why can't there be multiple solutions? Because A is non-singular. If A is non-singular, there's only one solution to Ax equals 0, which is x equals 0, right? There's no solution corresponding to and a vector in the null space of A because A is non-singular, okay? Now, so first of all, so basically, and then, so this tells you it's plus or minus one. Don't get too caught up in the determinant of A. So the determinant of A, if it's positive, it'll be on one side or the other. I'm not so worried about explaining this notion to you. 
What I'm interested in is you grasping that this is plus or minus 1. When you have Ax equals 0, there's only one root, which means that Ax equals 0 will only intersect the y-axis once, because there's only one root. So which means the degree is only plus or minus 1. And the degree depends on basically the slope of this. And so the reason why I have this is if you think about this thing, the slope, the counterpart in here becomes something like the determinant. It's not that easy to see that, so I don't want to get into that. Okay. So first of all, does everybody understand why this, uh, so I, I, I'm not so worried about you understanding why it's plus or minus, but the fact that it's 1, because it's only going to intersect once. It will never come back up because there's only one root. Okay, now this is a simple case where I know there's only one root. Problem is if there were two roots, it might be zero, and then you don't have any information. Now, let's take another case. Suppose phi of x is ax plus b, and I'm interested in when this is zero. Okay, so then what is the root of this is just, actually it should be negative a inverse b, I apologize. So, um, so I'm just looking, if I have an, a bounded open set omega containing negative a inverse b, same thing. Nothing changes, I'm just translating the problem. Okay. So in, in algebraic topology, this approach represents the starting point, this. But here we ad adopt what is called an axiomatic approach. And the axiomatic approach relies on three axioms for the degree. Okay. So, and these axioms I'm going to specify here, but before that I need to just def define the degree for the multivariate case. So previously I gave the univariate case, this is the multivariate case. So the set omega is a bounded open set. This, the mapping phi is, bound, is, is defined on the closure of omega and is continuous, not necessarily differentiable. And p is not a critical value. And what I mean by that is on the boundary of phi, uh, on the boundary of omega, so p doesn't lie in the boundary of omega. And what I mean by that is that basically the root of the equation is not on the boundary. Right? So essentially the equilibria are not on the boundary. Equilibria have to be inside. That's what I'm looking for. Okay? So let's take an example so everybody is on the same page. Okay, let's take this simple example. Phi of x is x above, uh, divided by the norm of x. Okay? Now, does anyone know what that looks like? What does x upon norm of x look like as x varies in Rn? First of all, what is the size of phi of x? What is the norm of phi of x? Hmm? Who said that? Yeah, exactly. It's 1. And why is it 1? Because phi of x is x upon norm x. And so norm of phi of x is just norm of x. And this is just a scalar that sits at the bottom. You get 1. Right? And for whatever value of x you get, your, so basically, phi of x resides on the boundary of a, of a ball of radius 1. What about the direction? What's your name? Fabio. Fabio, yeah. What, what, what direction does it take? So it takes a direction which is just x, right? It's just a unit vector in the x direction. So for every value, that's a unit vector. And it just ends on the sphere. Okay? And so the question that we're asking is, the question that you're asking is, if I take P as EI, what is EI? I, EI is the ith unit vector, right? So when does it equal the ith unit vector? Well, and if omega is this set, right? So we know, we know, we know that this is not a critical value because on the boundary, so in this case, this is not satisfied, right? Because look, what you have is that this this actually occurs at the boundary, right? So this is, doesn't quite work in this case. What about this case? Well, this doesn't even occur in the interior, right? Because look, these are vectors which are of magnitude two and between two and three. They're above. I mean, they they encircle the ball. They contain the ball, right? But I'm interested in roots that occur on the surface of that sphere, right? So. What you want to remember is the critical values have to be inside, 
right? They can't be on the sphere, on the surface. Okay, that's that's the starting point. We want to make sure that's the case because we use that in the analysis. I'll show you how. Okay, so let's let's start by giving you an understanding of the three axioms, and we'll go through some simple arguments then to kind of understand how to prove these. So a mapping is said to be a topological degree if the following three axioms are satisfied. The first thing is for the identity mapping. So what is the identity map? It's just a map that takes any vector and just produces the vector itself, right? So three axioms, let's write them out. So axiom one, axiom one pertains to the identity map, right? For the identity map, the degree of, now remember what the degree is, the degree takes as an input the map, in this case it's the identity map, the set and the critical value and this is equal to 1 for any for any vect, um, uh, for any bounded open set and any p p that lies in omega okay let me give you an example of that Okay, let me give you an example of that. Suppose omega is, suppose omega is negative, um, let me just say it's uh, 0, zero uh, sorry, suppose it's um, I want to give you a set which is Um, yeah, let's go. So this is the a ball of radius three. Okay. Now, um, let's some, assume that p is equal to p is equal to um, two times e two, which is basically two zero. So I'm interested in, I'm interested, if this is the identity map, the identity map takes x and gives you x, right? I'm interested in this question, when is the identity map equal to 2, 0? When does that happen? It happens at 2, 0, right? When x is 2, 0, the output is 2, 0. Now, if you're, does that happen inside this ball? Yes, right, happens inside this ball. So the degree of this is 1, which means that you always have a solution to this for any bounded open set, any bounded open set and any P that lies in. So in this case, the P was whatever and it lay inside this, okay. So I want to make sure, does everybody understand this? What we've done, so, and this is part of the construction. The way we do this, we use something called a homotopy theory. The idea is that if I want to show that there is a solution to an equation, I start by saying that I know there's a solution to some other equation and I keep modifying this equation till I get that equation, right? So the, and I'm going to give you the geometric intuition of that. So the theory you can always kind of, you know, go back and look at, but the geometry is, is something that I want you to grasp before we leave. So the second axiom is, yeah. At this point, all that I have, I have is just uh, in Euclidean space, Rn, nothing else, okay? No, the emphasis is only on it being non-zero, plus minus one, I don't care. The second axiom is the axiom of, uh, it's the additive property. It's the additive property and it basically says that if I take the degree, if I take the degree 
of phi omega p is the same as the degree of phi omega 1 p plus the degree of phi omega 2 p where omega 1 and omega 2 are disjoint sets right and the idea is simple right the idea is that if I tell you so this is one region this is the other region suppose it intersects twice and I go to another disjoint region and it intersects twice or thrice maybe the overall degree as you would intuitively expect should be the sum of these right if you've intersected twice here and thrice here if you look at the overall set it should be intersected five times right uh, actually not five times because this is plus one minus one plus one but you can you get the idea right um, so the degree is additive from the standpoint of disjoint sets okay now the third property is the most important and that's the one that we leverage it's called the homotopy invariance principle okay now what this tells you is that the degree of a mapping which is parameterized by t where t lies in 0 1 and so what I'm going to do right is I'm going to take the original problem and look at it as something which emerges when t goes to either 0 or 1 and I start with something for which I know the answer which is basically often the identity map so the identity map I know something and I keep changing t till I reach the other one so the idea is this so just to give you an idea suppose I'm interested in getting a solution to this problem but I don't know so this is the actual function so then I say oh I know something about the identity map which is this and then I keep modifying it and I get close to that okay so the geometry is you start with a map that you know and you end up with a map that you don't know and you use the homotopy invariance principle to conclude this. so it's a very powerful theory but it's 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 a bit abstract right um, and what okay so we have the homotopy invariance principle and I'm going to define what these HTs are for a particular case so HT is again the map this is the set that we had before and V of T is this um, is the trajectory of critical values that I'm interested in okay now V of T what the only thing we need is V of T does not lie on the image of of uh, H of boundary of omega T I just don't want to make sure this is these critical values can't lie on the boundary that's the only thing I want so basically it means equilibria cannot be in the boundary of my set you need to be inside okay that's what you should be concluding okay okay um, two simple results which don't require which I'm not going to prove um, if omega is an open bounded subset the degree of phi omega p is the same as the degree of phi minus p omega 0 so that's not difficult to imagine if I tell you I'm interested in this function and this is the p then this is the same as moving this function down and looking at the intersection at 0 right so and this function now is phi minus p very simple idea just you can shift it down and it's the same as looking at the critical value 0 clear Farzana clear similarly for any a if I look at this I can translate the domain uh, uh, translate where I'm taking the evaluating the map so here phi of x a is equal to phi of x plus a and the degree just changes in this fashion so basically just the set moves right so for instance uh, it's it's not difficult to imagine if I have this and I'm interested in this set I can always if I move this in some way I can just look at the corresponding set nothing really changes okay so these two just tell you about translation okay now this is the main result that we leverage okay that if the degree is non-zero then there exists an x hat such that phi of x hat equals p there is a solution to the nonlinear equation okay now look how this is this is not if and only if right so for instance if p is not in this then this is equal to zero but we don't say if this is zero then there's no solution we don't say that we can't say that if p doesn't lie in this then the degree is immediately zero 
which means that if there was no equilibrium, the degree is 0. But if the degree is 0, we don't know if there's no equilibrium. Okay, this is important. I keep emphasizing this because we all, I don't want people to leave assuming this is like this, this litmus test. We have to be a little careful about how we use it. Okay. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to prove the famed Brouwer's fixed point theorem. There are a host of fixed point theorems. This was the theorem that Nash used in the 50s. Okay. In the, uh, in the second paper. In the first paper he used Kakutani's theorem. In the first paper, uh, later on he simplified and used Brouwer's theorem. So these fixed point theorems are applied for different types of maps. So Brouwer's fixed point theorem just requires that the map be continuous and the set be con compact and convex. Later on, um, I'll introduce you to, but I won't prove, Kakutani's fixed point theorem, where the map is no longer continuous, but is basically is, uh, might have set valued, it's a set valued map. So every point there's, some, there's a set. So, um, so there's a fixed point theorem for that. So what does this fixed point theorem say? It says when the map is continuous and the set is, the set is compact and convex, then the mapping has a fixed point. It's a very powerful theorem, right? Now, how does it relate to us? It relates to us because if you look at it, the phi there is our natural map. The C is our X. So if I can somehow prove this, I can directly use it to prove that the natural map has a zero, in which case it's equivalent to saying that our problem has a solution or our game has an equilibrium. Okay, so does everybody see why I want to prove Brouwer? Now, of course, I could, I could just obviate this whole thing and not even prove Brouwer and take Brouwer for granted. The reason I want to prove Brouwer is one of, it's one of the first instances of where you can use degree theory so you can understand how powerful it is, how useful it is. And maybe if you find problems which are relatively uh, tractable from this standpoint, you might be able to use it, for which maybe some of these theorems cannot be directly applied. Um, okay, so let's start. Yes. Uh, so Brouwer's theorem yeah. works on a explain B maps C to C, right? So that's why Not C to C. Uh, oh yeah, in this case C to C. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I thought you were talking about yeah C to C. Like that question. So if you don't map C to, you went to C to R N. Yes, exactly. Does it work? No, no. Yeah. You have to do an extension. I'll show you that. This is not, you can't directly apply Brouwer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's some more machinery. There's always something more, <laughs> unfortunately. So, um, so, he, so Fabio makes an excellent point, right? So if you look at Brouwer's theorem, the image of the map is the set itself. But if you look at VIs, F maps from X to RN, not necessarily to X. You know, some cases you're lucky, it might be to X, but in general, no, it's not clear. So, but, but, so when you apply Brouwer, you can't directly apply Brouwer. You have to do a little more. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. When you're talking about the degree, so we're looking for, we just need the degree to be more than zero. Because yes. Because zero cannot say, but I'm asking, so what is zero now? Is that, do you manipulate it or what next? It, it, no, could you repeat the last part? You know, what a degree happens to the zero? Yeah, then you can't say anything. You, you just have to, you, <laughs> you're stuck. You can't use this approach. <laughs> Okay, so then it just means that the, there could be an equilibrium, there needn't be an equilibrium. You, you don't have, at least not, this, this avenue doesn't give you as much then. But if to play with the bounds, to see if the different bounds we make end up different degrees. Usually you do this in a more abstract regime, so the size of the set may not help you as much. I don't, I mean, unless there's something structurally that's going on. Now, now of course, um, so I'm not, I'm not convinced that if you just change something, you'll be able to, because remember, this is done using analysis. So it's not like there's a particular constant that you're playing with that you can just toggle with and you'll get existence. It's not that simple. There might be something where they may, uh, I, I should, I, I, I'll reserve comment on that. Maybe there are, but. Okay. So if, uh, if we extend the assumption or shrink the assumption and say that F is a differentiable function, yeah. then the degree of zero could also give us some more results, right? Because you could still evaluate the slopes of those. So, so the thing is that, f first of all, the, in this particular case, what we're doing is we're looking at, so, so are you saying in terms of counting? Yeah, in terms of counting or just getting more information about the... So you, yeah, so remember what I'm going to do, right? So when, you, when I provide you with results, the existence theorem, so I don't want you to kind of freak out and think every time I need to establish existence, I need to use this awful kind of thing. No, I'm going to give you something very tractable, 
which you can then just check the set and check the mapping to establish existence. So in, in 80 to 90% of the cases, you're going to be fine. But there are these 10% of the cases that the conditions that we've given you just don't work. In which case, you have to go back to first principles. So you want to view this as the first principle. Okay. Now to answer your question, um, if you, in general, the worry is not in terms of counting. The worry is just being able to establish this homotopy invariance principle. So I, I'm not, I think the problem is really in, in, on, on the end of establishing this principle for your nasty problem. As I said, 80% of the cases, most of the problems we all see, the assumptions that you'll see downstream. Because what we do is we build a foundation and then we give you a recipe which is easier to use. Right? So if you go, not all of you want to sit and pass through this nonsense. Right? It's not something you want to do. What you want to do is use the recipe I give you after this. Now there are instances when that recipe doesn't work and you want to go and make your own, in which case you have to come back to this. Okay? So I'm going to prove this for the case where the C, where C is actually a unit ball. And then I'm going to use this notion of, of a homeomorphism, which I'll define uh, to look at general sets. Okay? Now, let's start with this. This is called a homotopy. H of xt is x minus t phi x. Okay, so this is important. If you look at this, right, what, what happens when t becomes closer and closer to 0? You get the identity map. What happens when t becomes closer and closer to 1? Well, you get something which just looks like x minus phi x. But if this is equal to 0, you get a solution to the original problem. Okay, I want to make sure that everybody sees this. This is important. So, so when h of x, this is equal to x minus t times phi of x. So when you have h of x 0, that's x. That's the identity map. I know exactly when that has a solution, right? Because I'm interested in when this is 0 or this is p or whatever. And then I have h of x 1. What is that? That's x minus phi x. And when that's equal to 0, that's a solution to the original problem, right? Because I'm interested in this fixed point problem, x equals phi x, OK? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with t equal to 0. I'm going to try and understand that. And then I'm going to keep changing t. And then I'm going to use this homotopy invariance principle to say something. So uh, I didn't define this principle. I'm sorry. So this principle says that the degree is independent of t. OK, it's independent of t for any two continuous maps. So what that means is if I tell you that the degree at a particular point is something, it means it doesn't change at all, right? And that's why I use the identity map, because with the identity map, what is the degree? It's 1. So if I can establish this homotopy prin invariance principle, the degree stays 1. Now, you might think, well, I can use this to do, you know, to basically solve world hunger or something. No, that's not true, right? The, the rationale is that once you do this, there is there's some machinery along the way that precludes you from always using it, and you'll see it. So there are cases where you can't do it. I mean, naturally, I mean, this is not going to be a panacea for all our ills, right? OK, so, so it's based on the homotopy invariance principle. I'm going to start by defining the homotopy. h of xt is x minus t times phi of x, where x is defined on omega. Uh, x lives in, sorry, x lives in the ball, b. And t lives in 0, 1, the closed interval. Okay? I'm going to prove that the, resu uh, uh, the result by contradiction. So suppose phi has no fixed point on b. Okay? So for t equal to 0, h of xt is equal to x. Okay? And h of 0 is the identity map. So by axiom a1, we know the degree is 1. It's the identity map. We know 0 lies in, in, in the ball. Everything is fine and dandy. We know the degree is 1. This is the easy step, right? OK. Now, I'm going to say that suppose h of x hat t hat is equal to 0 for some x hat t hat in boundary, uh, in, on the boundary of b times 0. When I say boundary of b, I mean the surface of the ball. Okay. So I'm going to start with that. As, and why am I starting with that assumption? I'm starting with that assumption, and I'm going to show that that assumption gets violated 
right? Because look, the first thing I did was, this is where t is equal to 0, I, I found this. Now I'm saying, okay, let t be anything. And I'm going to say that suppose there is a, a solution h of x hat t hat equals 0. Now, let's, let's go through the analysis on the board so that you see it. So H of, so suppose right, so X hat in boundary of B, T hat in 0, 1, okay. Now what is H of X hat T hat? It's X hat minus t times phi of x hat is equal to 0, which means x hat is equal to t hat phi of x hat, okay. x hat lies in boundary of B, right, which means x hat over so this implies the norm. So these are two vectors. Now if they're equal, it means their norms are equal. A t hat is a non, okay. I can divide this by x hat, norm of x hat, which is the same as t of phi of x hat over norm x hat. But this is the same as t hat of phi of x hat over t hat norm phi of x hat. But this cancels. So you have phi of x hat over norm phi of x hat. But we know what is this ratio? One. one. Why is it one? No, no, yeah, but we said x hat is on the boundary of B, so the surface of the ball, right? Because it's on the surface of the ball, this is 1, which means this has to be 1. So everybody see these steps, okay? So if that is the case, what we have is h of x hat t hat. So now if this is the case, It follows that, it follows that phi of x hat lies on the boundary of B and t hat has to equal 1, okay. So now we have that h of x hat t hat equals 0 with t hat equals 1, which implies that phi of x hat is equal to x hat. Right? We've got a solution, but what's the problem, right? But this violates our initial claim that there is no fixed point of phi in B because look at the outset what we said was that there is no, this violates our initial claim, sorry there is no fixed point of phi in the boundary of B, I should be careful, this is boundary of B, look at our initial assumption, this is my, on the, on the, on the ball B, uh, one second. Um, one second. Huh? Ah, yeah. This violates our initial claim that there is no fixed point because look at this. We are starting by saying, yeah, sorry. Suppose phi is no fixed point on the ball B, right? We are starting with this assertion. We find that there is a fixed point, so this violates the initial claim, which means that 0 cannot lie in H of boundary BT, because that's what I did. I assumed that suppose H of X hat T hat equals 0 was something on the boundary. This is not true, so consequently this holds, right? Now, why do I care about this holding? Because this holding is crucial. 
look at look at the homotopy invariance principle. I need to make sure the Vt is the p that we have, the degree. We need to make sure that this holds. If this doesn't hold, we can't apply the homotopy invariance principle. So through a contradiction argument I showed, I can apply the homotopy invariance principle. So now, in addition, we know that H is continuous. You need H to be continuous. We know Vt is 0 throughout because the critical points I'm checking for the Ps are always 0 in this case, right? So now I can use the homotopy invariance principle where omega is the interior of B because omega is an open set, okay? So once I have that, we're done. We say the degree by the homotopy invariance principle, the degree of H of T is independent of T. So the degree of H of 0 is equal to degree of H of 1. But what is the degree of H of 0? It's 1, which means the degree of H of 1 is also 1. But what is, it, what is H of 1? It's x minus phi of x, which means x minus phi of x equals 0 has a solution. Okay. So what we have shown is that there exists an x hat such that H of x hat 1 equals 0. Therefore, x hat equals phi of x hat. Phi has a fixed point in P. Okay, don't worry about the homeomorphism yet. Let's go through this proof slowly again. Okay. Yes, Fabio. No, the, that was not right. Like, why can we explain that the that degree is independent of T? That, that yeah, so let me show you that. Yeah. So the 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 claim that the degree is, is independent of T comes from this this principle. This is called the homotopy invariance principle. And it's not something you can always conclude, right? The way you conclude that the homotopy uh, so, so that the degree is invariant with T is that you need to have continuous maps H and V of T. V of T is what this thing is equal to. In our case, this is zero for everything. So it's trivially continuous. H is the sum of X and phi. It's also continuous. The big question is you need to make sure zero doesn't lie in the H of the boundary of omega. That's the pain. Always making sure that's, you know, and that is, uh, what is that in words? That just means that the equilibria have to be in the interior. They can't be at the boundary. Okay? And if you can show that, you're, you're almost always done. So now, so what did we do? We started by saying, we started by saying, we defined a homotopy. Now you might say, how do you come up with a homotopy? What is the right? Well, think about what you want to solve for at the end. If you want to solve for a fixed point problem, you want to solve for something which is x minus phi of x equals zero, then you say, oh, and you, and you have to think about what you have access to. You always have access to the identity map. So you want that in the homotopy. And in the limit you want the original, which is x minus phi x. Right? So you start with what you have, x, and then you end up with what you need, which is x minus phi x. Okay. Well, I have a suggestion. If we can implement this for, I don't know, Nash Kornel gave us an example, it might be more So what I'm going to do, right? So. The way this works is that you don't implement it directly. What we do is we say this theory is then applied to variational inequalities. And then that, that condition we can refine for each of these. And that's what we do. Okay. But do we have an example on this? So I'm going to show you yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, Arno? Yeah, so I'm going to go through it further. So, so I'm going to prove the result by con. I'll just go through the whole proof again, just so that everybody's with me. So we start by contradiction. We assume, so we start by saying that phi has no fixed point on the ball B. Okay. So now, we start with t equal to 0. When t is equal to 0, we know the degree is 1. Then we say that suppose h of x hat of t is equal to 0 for some point on the boundary, where x is on the boundary. So we're starting by making an assumption that the equilibrium is on the boundary. And we know that that's something we don't have, or we're going to derive a contradiction to, to violate that somehow. So in this particular case, we're able to go and show that there is a contradiction, right? This violates our initial, we're able to show there's a fixed point, but this violates our, our claim that there was no fixed point. Consequently, that claim is violate, is, is incorrect. That zero does not lie in H of boundary B of T, right? Because that was violated right there when I said X hat, H of X hat T hat is zero. So now we say, oh, there can't be. So this can't be. So the homotopy invariance principle can be applied. Now, when you apply that, what do we know? We know the starting degree is 1. The degree doesn't change. Ending degree has to be 1. 
and we're done. Okay? So even if you don't remember all the details, what you should be thinking is degree theory is just a way to take your problem and relate it to an easy problem and just keep modifying the easy problem till you get the hard problem. And the way you do that is to leverage the homotopy invariance principle. Right? So I don't expect all of you to go back out there and start kind of generating proofs on degree theory. That's not the goal of this lecture. The goal is to just give you a, a, an exposure to the analytical tools that are necessary to build this foundation. Okay? But you're not going to need all of this. As I go ahead, there'll be much more tractable statements which you can directly cherry pick and say, hey, I can check that. I can check that. I can directly claim existence. Okay? So for instance, the simplest existence result for Nash is players have quasi-concave payoff functions, they're maximizing, and compact convex strategy sets. Equilibriums emerge immediately, right? You don't need anything else, but I mean, it's using degree theory or fixed point arguments below, right? It's like a car, right? You've got a, you don't need to know how the engine works and everything else works. But there are instances where it's very easy. Just check, do you have quasi-concave payoff functions? Do you have you know, closed convex strategy sets, you're done, right? So for instance, Cournot in this case, you could easily just relate it to that. The problem comes with Cournot is when you lose compactness, right? Anyway, so let's move on. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, previous slide, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, um, so, so if you take norms on both sides, Arno, what do you get? So this norm is one. Yeah. So if you take norms on both sides, these vectors are equal, right? So all I'm saying is, so, so if the vectors are equal, so if I take norms on both sides, this is going to be equal to one, right? Because this is one. So that's, how, so that's how I was able to claim that this is, um, um, so I, I didn't quite understand your question. So this is, you're not convinced by this argument? Wait, wait what, what is that you're not convinced by? I don't understand how we can deduce that the norm of phi x is equal to 1. Norm of phi x, because the norm of x hat, so this, so remember now we're at, So, so I concluded that t is equal to 1, which means that x hat is equal to phi of x hat, right? So now I know that this is equal to 1 because this is on the boundary. It's a unit ball, x hat is on the boundary. So maybe I can talk to you offline because look, if I get this and I take the norms on both sides, this is x hat is on the boundary of B. If it's on the boundary of B, we know x hat has its norm is 1. But phi of x hat is equal to x hat, which means its norm also has to be 1. So, um, okay, I'll, I'll talk to you offline, yeah. Okay, so then, um, now, if I'm interested in looking at general convex, compact convex sets, which are not necessarily unit balls, then we conduct what, we construct what is called a homeomorphism. So what is a homeomorphism? It's a relationship between, um, uh, it's a relationship between two, two sets. So a mapping phi that goes from S to T is said to be a homeomorphism if phi is continuous and bijective, and phi inverse, the reverse direction is also continuous. So let me give you some, some insight into this. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. The idea is basically I can take any unit ball, construct a mapping to any other convex set and go back. So if I can get a, a result on the unit ball, I can get the result on a compact convex set. So if f is a function taking values in B, then uh, f is called an injection if it maps distinct objects into distinct objects. So this is called a one-to-one -one mapping. It's also called an injective mapping. If you go in the reverse direction, so uh, not in the reverse direction. Uh, if, you, if you have a function that is defined on the set taking values in b, it's said to be a surjection. If for any b, there exists an a and a that, that leads to a point in b. 
so for any point in B, you can find a point in A that takes you there. Now, if a mapping is both surjective and injective, then it's called bijective. So this mapping has to be bijective, which is one to one and on to. And the inverse mapping is also continuous. And with this, you can, um, you can use this, this definition of homeomorphism to extend Brouwer's theorem to general convex sets. I'm not going to do that. You know, I think that's beyond the scope of the class. So. But I just want to tell you how we do it, the idea. Okay, you don't need to spend as much time on that. Now, so th there have been questions about how do you apply this, these results more generally. Okay, so now let's think about that. So if K is a compact convex set and F is a continuous map, that's our VI. I've, met, I've said nothing about any other properties of F, just that it's continuous. Okay, so take any game, strategy sets are compact and convex, and just take the first order gradients. Okay, that's your mapping F. It turns out that that's all you need. If the set is compact, convex, and actually you need non-empty, of course, and the mapping is continuous, then the solution set is, is non-empty. So there is a solution. So equilibria exist immediately when you have continuous maps and compact convex sets. How do you prove this? Just by saying that you write down the fixed point using, um, so this is, so basically you can write it as the natural map equals zero or x is equal to the projection of x minus f of x, right? And then you use Brouwer's on this. Now, so the mapping here is from k to k to Arno's point. So this map, or oh, somebody, no, Fabio's point. This mapping is from k to k. Because remember, what you're doing is you're taking x and you're projecting onto k. Okay, not always. In some other cases, we might have to deal with other issues. But here, the right-hand side is always in k. Okay. So thus, by Brouwer's fixed point theorem, we have a fixed point for this. Now remember, the Brouwer that I, I, I uh, proved k was a unit ball, but using the homeomorphism argument, you can extend that to general convex sets, okay? Okay, now let's relate this to Nash equilibrium. This was a question that was raised. How do you relate this to Nash equilibrium? How do you directly kind of invoke these arguments? So an, a Nash equilibrium exists in an n-player game when for each player, the set xi is compact, convex, or non-empty. Okay, so suppose you have linear constraints and capacity constraints, immediately compact, convex, non-empty. And theta is a continuously differentiable and convex function in X for each X minus I. Immediately you have existence. Okay? So Nash established the existence of an equilibrium using Kakutani's theorem. And then one year later, he improved the proof by directly applying Brouwer's theorem. Okay? So I think the original paper was like five pages. I think it's remarkable. Okay, you can also do this for saddle point theorems. So saddle points are basically um, when you have constraints. So I'm not going to go into that. I had that. I, I didn't want to spend time on that. So now let's look at uh, set valued maps. So a set valued map, um, let's see. Um, so I want to just give you some intuition on, on, on contractive mappings. Let me see how much I have here. Uh, I have a, a question. Yeah, yeah, go on. About the homotopy function. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you can use a function that you know to track a function that you don't know to find the root. So yes, yeah. So here, the assume that you know this function, not the, the, the initial function. The x, well, the ident because there we always assume we just start with the identity map. You always start with that. You know, it's a convenient one to start with. Because I think that depends on how nonlinear is the function that so, you are. But remember, we're not interested in the rate or any, any of that stuff. We don't care because we're just looking at this from the standpoint of. Now, are there other settings? If you know that there's some other function for which you always have a root, you can start with that, I suppose. So it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary because you just need something for which you know the degree is 1. But there aren't too many functions for which you always know the degree is 1, right? 